Hello, hi everyone. Uh, welcome for our first um, uh, talk, our, our first webinar with uh, uh, Chartered Institution of Civil Engineering Surveyors. We're doing this for the first time um, with um, uh, with CISIS. Um, we I'll just give a, um, uh, whilst we're waiting. I think we're waiting for a few more uh, people to join. Um, I'll just give a few uh, organize uh, kind of notes from organizers from um, our Sustain project and CISIS. Um, and then I will introduce uh, Jim, and we can talk a little bit more about the topic of today's uh, conversation. Um, well, first of all, the webinar is going to last for one hour. We will have um, probably around 10 minutes in the end for Q&A. Please feel free to post all your questions in the chat and uh, feel free to write any notes or comments if you would like to um, uh, um, you know, give us um, some points for conversation and um, please participate as much as you, as you like and as you can. Um, we also have QR code on the right hand side, top right hand side of the screen. Please, if you can, fill in your information because uh, CISIS is collecting information about people attending webinars. It's for us as Think Project as well to get uh, some data on who um, came today for uh, for for this um, conversation. Uh, we're also going to send a copy of the slides. Please feel free to record and you know write down as much information as you like. But we will be distributing the slides after um, the event. And also a copy of recording of um, today's webinar will go on the um, YouTube channel of CISIS and also Think Project. Uh, so you will have a chance to share this with anyone who might have missed it today and um, revise any information you, you would like to uh, look at later. So um, having said that, so I am privileged to be joined today by Jim McClaskey, um, um, who is a highly experienced commercial manager at Kia. He's a fellow of CISIS and he's also chair of commercial management practices committee. Um, so I'd let um, Jim to introduce himself, but I think it's a huge privilege for me to have him here today. I must mention that we first met a couple of, well, maybe more than a couple of years ago now, before COVID, for sure, um, at the RICS assessments. And since then, we stayed in touch. And every time I meet Jim at local events in London or um, when we catch up, I personally I love hearing different stories about his experience. He um, obviously, um, he wears, um, more than one hat. You can see he's uh, he's wearing a, a hard hat on this picture, but he he wears more than one hat in his real life, and it's difficult to list all of his achievements and all of his um, uh, obviously charter shapes and everything he holds. So, Jim, over to you. Please introduce yourself and welcome people on today's webinar, please. Thank you, Val. Um... As Val said, a very good introduction there. I wouldn't say no more, really, but I'm Jim McCluskey. Um, I provide senior commercial support to large projects. Uh, I've worked on major programmes probably since the uh, late 90s, predominantly large infrastructure projects, um, including rail, um, transportation, um, nuclear, etc. And I've got a lot of experience I can hopefully impasse uh, during this one hour session. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the interactive bits where, where we're going to ask you to take part and uh, fielding any questions at the end. Um, but yeah, um, let's go for it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jim. So for myself, I, I also, I well, I, I'm um, um, chartered conservator. I also, um, I'm, I'm civil engineer by background and design engineer. So I've spent a number of years wearing the same hats um, Jim uh, wears on this picture, but currently I've worked for a Think Project um, as a consultant. And my role is to really um, make contracts uh, look simple for our clients. Uh, make sure that we support uh, with uh, digital tools, uh, any, um, uh, you know, delivery um, related issues uh, can be resolved. Anything can be simplified uh, with the use of cloud technology. Therefore, we have this topic to discuss um, um, today. So we, we have NEC contracts through the lens of um, um, iCloud, kind of cloud technology and 
and anything which can be supported with digital digital tools. Um, so uh, I will cover the agenda very briefly. So we will have a discussion about the general contract administration, why in, um, in construction we are observing a um, new type of contracts, um, such as, I mean, they're not entirely new, but this, this is still a modern cluster of contracts um, prompting more contract administration. What challenges we still have in contract management in the industry and why we, despite of all um, um, different supporting tools we have, why we're still struggling to um, achieve dispute free environment. Um, how can we build um, required confidence and skills and, and, and what is in general needed in, um, in, um, in this environment? So how we can enable people working on projects, what sort of issues they experience and how we can support them. Also, um, what we're looking to gain today is uh, that these incremental steps, because you, you can't see the difference immediately. So sometimes it requires, you know, you require a very slow process of incremental small changes to see uh, the true impact of uh, digital solutions on the construction side. And also how you can really take an advantage of that. So you, we, we, we do learn from people at the start it can be a difficult journey you can spend a lot of time learning how to do things differently but what in the end it, it can deliver to you as a and your team as a benefit so and we will have some um, time for q a in the end as well right um so uh, kind of to, i want to pause a little bit so we we prepared we actually want to make this um webinar very interactive for you. We want to make sure that you're not just sitting here listening to us, but also giving us some input back. So I'd like you to take your mobile phone. So hopefully when we're talking about digitalization and technology, people have their mobile phones. Um, uh, put it on uh, picture mode, scan this QR code. I'm pretty sure the majority of you can know how to use it. And please, if you can, uh, vote for us because you will be, you actually will be able to see the results on your screen yourself so you will be able to grasp roughly what sort of demography and what, what sort of people we have um, coming for today's discussion so based on that we can hopefully me and Jean we can tailor discussion and put it in the right direction so I can see some uh, results already appearing on the screen we I can see 37 40 people voted um, we, we good news we have almost half um, a, a little bit less of contractors so they're always very active people um subcontractors small number which is uh, something i personally would like to see more because if uh, if you're writing these webinars please by all means share and invite your subcontractors and your supply chain because it's also a big part of the journey so if you as contractors enabling your own teams your subcontractors should equally be um, you know, up to date with what's going on in, in digital space and construction. Uh, we've got consultants, uh, you know, probably relatively small number of clients. So I can see 79 people voted actually so far, which is great. Um, so thank you. I'll keep the poll open for a bit. Uh, Jim, just pro from you. your observation. So is this something you expected to see? Because I, I, in general, I can see uh, you know, people working for contractors and clients, they're quite active. So we have less clients today. We have the majority of contractors. We have a lot of um, consultants as well today on the, on the call. We have 8% of other, we can probably explore more. Maybe if you are, um, if you are there in the chat, please write down what's your role, because it would be good to know what, what exactly, what role you're performing. Um, so we can check that. But Jim, is this something you expected to see? What's your uh, general observation about um, the audience the today? I think I think the membership at the ICS is made up uh, of, of different roles that are listed there. Uh, but a lot of contract people who work for main contractors or subcontractors. Uh, some people will be employed by consultants or working as consultants. Some indeed will be uh, working direct for client or employers. Um, and some will be legal, working in the legal or uh, you know sort of construction law field. Um, so it's a broad church in that in that regard. Um, so I'd expect to see uh, a range of um, participants really on, on the call. Uh, I can't see I can't see on the video. 
<laughs> okay. All right. Well, that, that's good news. So again, if you, if you belong to other category you've selected, please write down um, in the chat what's your role and where it would be good to um, maybe we can pick up some questions later if there is something you know, if, there, if there's, a, we were trying to present kind of all the major uh, roles um, of people working in construction, but if, if there is something else, please write down in the chat. Um, right. So um, next um, kind of next step is oh, apologies. So next step is um, the first part of our agenda. So the first question is, uh, what, what is contract administration and why why it is important? Why we suddenly talk about uh, all these different contracts and why we 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 um, we are so concerned about this topic, right? Because it didn't exist at some point, and uh, we we never had people even having a title called contract administrator in construction. So it's it's relatively new thing. Uh, apologies. So just one second. I'm going to scroll back. I lost my slides. Apologies. Um, so, um, Jim, I, I think um, on this slide, I want to get over to you. And actually, I know you have a very fascinating story of where you started in construction, how you observe different forms of contracts uh, evolving and developing. And from your perspective, can you give us an overview where you started your journey? Um, uh, 30 years ago, I believe, maybe a little bit more. <laughs> so I don't want you to <laughs> to to make look old, but um, very experienced, obviously. So can you talk us through that and give us a bit of overview and actually tell us why contract administration is so crucial uh, for NEC contract? Okay, thank you. Um, so my journey started. I think my first project was in 1984, and it is. Uh, it was a JCT project. It was construction of a large uh, conference and leisure centre, and we were the subcontractors on on that project um, to to a main contractor stroke developer. And the main contractor developer is no longer in existence. Um, and it was my first experience of contracts uh, right at the junior end. And I was the concrete and bonus bonus surveyor on that project uh, at very junior level. Uh, working out bonuses to uh, payable to our concreters and concrete finishers for the based on the volume of concrete they poured per week. So that was my uh, early introduction into um, contracts. Uh, but, but largely from there, I went in. I went on to civil engineering and infrastructure. Um, so so from there, it was like road projects, bypasses, highways, improvements. They were procured under the ICE conditions of contract, uh, predominantly fifth edition and, and then the sixth. Um, and that kind of ran ran through to the I'd say the mid the mid nineties. Um, and then I started working on the more larger more larger pro, uh, programs, um, including the A13 in East London uh, from Dagenham into Barking, uh, which was an ICE fifth. Uh, and again, we didn't. Uh, when it was initially put together, we didn't have a contract administration um, a platform. So it was a hard copy. Hard copy letters were issued to and from contractor to project manager. Um, additional items and what we call compensation items and NEC were issued as hard copies. The application for payment was in about three three lever arch files, and so a hell of a lot of paper, lots of files filing cabinets filling up on, a, on what was a five-year project um, but towards the end of that project we introduced um, we attempted to introduce uh, a database for um, scanning and filing correspondence and it was called PIMS project information management uh, uh, software uh, and it was developed by SimServe and pioneered by Tarmac Construction as it was back then um, and, and it was my first experience of doing something which was uh not involving hard copies but um we didn't really it, it was a bit clunky um the, the computer um hardware wasn't capable to manage large volumes of data um, but it was a start and it was it was a move into the the world of information technology uh as to how, how, did you feel for the, 
how did it feel for the team? So did you feel that it was also a cultural shift to go and make people work in a different way? So just just from your perspective, so obviously that was the first step, but how how did it feel for the team? Did you see much resistance from the members of the team to work differently? I, th I don't think it was much resistance, but it was more it was more some people didn't think they were technically able to um, to to do online what was an, an online tool uh, even back then. Um, so so I think it was more of an education. Uh, and even today, that education and training is, is vital in getting uh, our staff upskilled so that they can all manage um, their obligations on in the modern world of construction and contract administration. Absolutely, yeah. And um, at, at some point, when did you feel that even this process was not exactly what, you know, fulfilling the, the full range of obligations you, you have to do in the contract? So was it NEC contract or did it happen before? So just just to understand where that shift happened, where people realized they, they can't work with, um, even if there are not paper documents, but even the, the you know, the database. Uh, for old type of database uh, is not sufficient anymore. And, and just, just for information, that was the first project. I got my own email address back then as well. So, um, but yeah, uh, that was an ICE um, fifth edition project. Um, so very much traditional um, uh, relationships with the engineer, the engineer being the, um, I guess what we call the the person that controlled the project manager's uh, roles and responsibilities, uh, and then on our side there you have the contractor who was delivering the work. It was a design and build contract. Um, but from that project, I moved on to HS1, the St Pancras Station, and that was for me um, the first large NEC project I've worked on. Not not the first, but the first large one. And the first one to use contract administration portal for the management of communications uh, to and from contractor. Um, so that was where the the change occurred for me in terms of um, the bigger programs were moving towards uh, online um, processes and databases. Okay, well, that, that's good to hear. And in general, that, that journey going from a more traditional type of UK contracts into more collaborative contracts, did you feel that this, you know, it, it was obviously something um, like a step by step journey for yourself, but how did you feel it worked for kind of individuals joining um, the, the teams and working for you, maybe more junior roles? Um, so, was it difficult to work? With this type of individuals, or with someone who's been in construction for a while, to change their mindset and, uh, you know, culturally align with new reality or new realm of, of uh, you know, new new kind of generation of contracts, or did you feel that uh, because NEC went through the certain kind of development itself, it was a uh, it was a slow journey. Um, I think the NEC. Um, by, by virtue of its the way it's put together, um, it's a collaborative part of the contract, or, or should be certainly the intent of the drafters. You know, it's a collaborative contract with the parties. Um, I think there are some individuals uh, back then in the industry which were struggling with the collaborative side of it um, because previous contracts. Um, engendered adversarial behaviour, you know, like uh, them and us, you know, you know, the contractor, subcontractor, contractor to uh, employer, project manager. Um, so what the NEC has, and I think, has helped a great deal is to try and bring parties working closely together. Um, and I think those individuals that can't come to terms with that collaborative working probably that probably won't succeed, um, and, and, and that's unfortunate because there's some very, you know, very good pedic skills and experience out there. But there has to be a different mindset to um, how you approach working with parties delivering these projects, small or small or large, um, in, in my opinion. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we see more and more um, um, of, uh, 
especially, I mean, when we talk about different jurisdictions, we talk about uh, people working in different countries and there are civil law country um, code and contracts. There are also common law um, country contracts, which are very sim uh, very different from each other. So they, they have certain mechanisms which cannot be um, replicated um, outside the UK, for example, in Europe and vice versa. But from my personal experience, I can see more and more NEC contracts making their way into Europe, into Hong Kong, into like in different in countries in Asia, in Australia, and where people use um, the, them because they are famous and known for um, collaboration, for uh, integrating teams together, bringing them together, making sure that they are working toward the same same goal. Um, and I think this is great. And when we talk about standard forms of contract, and that's why I was interested in your experience, because obviously your journey includes quite a few different uh, suites of contract and different forms of contract. And even in the NEC world, you've gone through, you know, very first edition of NEC and, you know, to what we have now in the industry. And um, it's interesting to, to hear from your perspective how you know, things changed in contract in the kind of standard contracts world, right? But my next uh, point, which I, I'd like to get to, is um, we still we still have issues in construction, right? So if you look at the bigger picture, uh, NEC contracts there they are designed to enable collaboration. They are designed to assist with all of the complexity issues, uh, you know, compliance, security, um, making sure that the team's working together, but we're still not quite there, right? So um, I, I think it's, a, I didn't see the rec most recent report, but in 2020, um, um, Arcadis or 2021, Arcadis published their findings about the fact that, you know, the average dispute in construction, um, we're not just talking about the UK market, but um, a, a worldwide was around 30, uh, 30 million. So the, that's the cost of the average dispute. And also it, it takes up to 10 months to resolve those disputes. The, the, obviously the, the scale of the issues is um, relatively substantial, right? So when we talk about this, um, but also how do we manage those large infrastructure contracts? I know, Jim, you involved in large infrastructure contracts. I personally also um, had the privilege to work on quite a few big schemes in, in London and abroad as well. And my observation is when we stick to the contract, when we have a, a very well drafted contract, the, the possibility of something going wrong is kind of less that's that's again my my perspective so when we talk about um um you know also management of contracts when you have required skills and competence and people know what they're doing they worked in the contract before they're properly qualified again so that that you know risk also reduces reduces substantially so um you kind of have less errors, less mistakes uh, being made. So I'm just, you know, I'm just setting the scene here, but, you know, we, ha we have all of these beautiful contracts. We, we have got them tested and trialed and people work with them, but why, why these challenges still exist, right? So this is my question to you in here is the challenges, they, they can probably be split for certain related to co contract drafting or pre-contract execution and also contract execution stage and in here i really want to hear your practical um, experience and views of um, why we have them i mean i've listed some of the bullet points in here but you know can you tell me first how in your view um, deviation from standard terms and conditions you know what sort of impact it has right and maybe do you see more of these, um, um, you know, amendments today than what was happening at the time when you started working in, uh, in, uh, you know, in construction as a contract manager and, and commercial manager? Yeah, I think um, clients are more sophisticated in how they put these contracts together. Um, they've been working with NEC on major programs for probably 20 20 plus years. Um, so increasingly, we're getting a lot more um, additional clauses put in to cover, try to cover all, all angles and, and, and spread the risk uh, uh, proportionately to contractor and, and client. Um, and indeed, it's not uncommon to see 
you know, 40 plus Z clauses and even more, you know, um, depending on, on the contract and depending on the circumstances in which it's being built, um, particularly with contracts like HS2, which um, tend to touch on lots of stakeholders. So that there are normally additional clauses put in about how you deal with the consenting requirements to work in, in, in the land that are owned by the stakeholders, for example. Um, and, and such like. So it, it, it's and one of the things on these contracts with, with so many additional clauses and changes to existing clauses is that the uh, training and understanding of how what that means to the parties has to be given out because if you if your own staff don't fully understand it, then then then, then that that's going to cause difficulties because it means they may they may misinterpret. What the scope of works are, for example, as, as distinct from what additional additional works are, for example. So, um, so I guess my my advice would be uh, on projects at the right time is that they, there has to be training on on what, what what does the contract changes mean to to the contractor and to the project manager, stroke employer client. Um, so that the parties administering the contract can understand the, um, you know, can have a better understanding of the meaning of the changes or the new clauses, um, because the, sometimes the words are not in, uh, they're intended to be in plain English, but sometimes they're, they're complicated and difficult to fully understand what the obligations are on those provisions. So. Um, so a, a good, a good, efficient working contract has that facility in place uh, um, within within the project teams to provide that level of training, and it can be shared and collaborative as well if the parties want to do that. And do you think that the, the training, obviously, um, I, I, again, it, it fascinates me sometimes. So you you may have uh, individuals work, who have been in the industry for a while, and they know that they know everything. Things. I, I don't want to call it arrogance, but I, I want to, it's it's probably more of a habit and experience which sometimes is prevailing and making people, you know, uh, make more mistakes, in fact, because, you know, uh, new contracts, even, even existing forms, they are um, changing from time to time, right? So we're having new uh, revisions um, and the new versions of these contracts coming in. Um, how can you ensure that you your staff is really up to date because you know we, we always say read your contract but how many people are actually reading that contract how can you create that structure i mean obviously making it um uh, making it really efficient outside any digital soft uh, dig digital environment is very difficult because people you, you you never know what information they they have and how they know about provisions of the contract so how does it how is it happening at the moment where, where you are? So how do you ensure that people uh, have sufficient knowledge and and, um, and really understand their contracts? Yeah, um, I, I think I said earlier that, that um, you're into training program, but um, you try and capture on, on big projects, you have a lot of stuff. So you may need to have it refreshed every six or 12 months, but maybe part of the onboarding process onto a project. Uh, I know when I was on the Olympics, for example, there was bespoke training provided on, on the NEC suite of contracts that we were using there. And that was refreshed every six to nine months. Um, so it depends on the scale of the, of the operation and, and the capacity uh, of the um, parties to, to want to provide it. In addition to that, professional institutions like the CICS, of course, um, the CIOB, RICS, APM, they provide um, seminars, webinars um, on topical issues, so some on NEC contracts, for example, uh, which I always suggested to, I'd always recommend going to because you can never stop learning. Um, there's always things that, as you say, Val, you, you you may well have a lot of experience, but you may not be fully aware of a, a particular change, for example. Um, you know, and these the, these forums can help that. Uh, in, in in addition to that, the Civil Engineering Contractors Association do provide a a, a lovely program of uh, NEC training, uh, a detailed program of all aspects, including program. Uh, 
um, correspondence, compensation, event change management, risk management. Um, so, and, and, and whoever our members are of the seeker um, can, can get free places at these training courses. So, so there's lots of stuff out there, but I think, I think the particular and specific training that can relate to your own contract to improve your own understanding of it is the best. Okay. Okay, that's great. So now I, I think I, I want to move on from this and well, I want to really touch on skills and, uh, and experience and confidence you create uh, in the team. Uh, we, we touched on it briefly just, just now, but in terms, of, um, in terms of simplifying contract management, so this is something I think we've discussed with you in the past as well. And these are sort of four pillars I can see which fundamentally can be without even touching on the digital platform forms and digital uh, digital environment so these sort of um, elements and four pillars you you should really consider when when you start managing your contract so I think um, so governance is very important one so uh, we can we can touch on this a little bit later uh, collaboration is something which NEC contracts enable and we should probably be um, fine as long as we observe all um, um, kind of mechanisms in the contract uh, control is uh, not just cost control because people quite often concerned about cost, but actually there are many more different things we can we can observe and control in uh, in the environment of um, contract management. So it can be to do with risks. So because risk eventually materializes in cost and increased um, and and a longer schedule as well. So this is something you you have to be focused on. Um, how you manage? We talked about cost and payments, but also the statuses of your requests, because in NEC contracts, um, um, certain time bar events um, may um, at some point really have a you know an impact on your entitlement because you missed the deadline of response and you you haven't replied to something. So I think that these are. Things not everyone is thinking about, unless you know um, NEC contracts really well and you have a lot of experience. But also analyzing um, your information whilst you go along, because again, we tend to think, you know, I, I quite like the concept of final account, but I'm glad it's not something which is fundamentally existing for NEC contracts, because you have to analyze and you have to go through your um, your um, um, progress. Uh, whilst you're still delivering, because something with you know analytics, analyzing information, analyzing not just your cost, but again risk time, quality, and and um, even the way you're interacting with another party can have an impact because you can make that shift and you can make that change and um, really make it um, you know make a difference on your current um, contract and project. So, what's your view on that, James? So, is this something? which you, I mean, I'm not even again talking about digital environment. I'm talking about uh, the way you're organizing your work on site. Is this something you're actively doing? Can you pick one of uh, um, examples or maybe one of the features and comment on that? Um, well, I think increasing on the bigger programs, risk management is one, one important factor uh, because on you know, uh, even on smaller programs, but particularly bigger ones, there's a lot, there's a lot of associated risks which can't be priced, or if they can be priced, they're estimated because we don't know the full extent of, of what that risk is. For example, um, uncharted services, for example, or um, you know the, the ground condition, ground condition makeup. There, there may well be a, a site information report or a geotechnical baseline report, but sometimes. Um, the information can be inaccurate. Um, so when you dig a hole in the ground, what, what you might find might be different to um, what the report's saying you would expect to find. So, um, so that, and that's where risk comes in because risk allows um, those type of, uh, of issues and potential issues to be flagged up and, and monitored whilst those operations are being undertaken, particularly uh, on civil engineering projects where a lot of a lot of work can be below ground and. Um, it's those unforeseen or, or unexpected that can hurt the program and hurt the, the, the cost forecast. Okay, okay. Well, yeah, and this is all also highlighted on this slide, so we're not going to cover all of these points, but kind of uh, this also outlines what, what still 
can be an obstacle to achieving the success, even if you are relying on knowing what needs to be done. So you, you, you're, still, you're still struggling, right? So and this is leading us to the next um, kind of stage um, of, um, of the presentation where we're going to be talking about, um, well, let's let's first um, uh, get, gain your opinion because um, um, we, we discussed what, what could be struggles and we showed you this on the previous slide. If, again, you pick up your phones, please, if possible, and uh, vote for, um, I mean, you have to uh, rank options below one to four. So one being the most challenging for uh, being least challenging. So if you could please, um, vote for us so we can see where you struggle the most with uh, obligations um, on your contracts. So then we can discuss it briefly here as well. I can see almost all of them. I mean, change control obviously is a big thing and I personally probably will vouch for the same. Um, And I know, Jim, we discussed it before. I know Jim is, uh, is has mentioned exactly the same change control is always, uh, I guess, the main um, um, point of pain uh, on any construction project because it's, um, yeah, it's fast and very difficult to um, take control of a, um, right, I think change control is still winning here. So, Jim, any comments from you uh, just seeing the results? We have change control and we have governance and authority uh, where people struggle the most. It looks like uh, the people get better with collaboration these days and reporting is, is okay, but it's all right as well. Yeah, I think that uh, governance authority is, is, is a factor because, um, say, uh, in contracting organisations, um there, there are delegated authorities so you know you you have limits on depending on your role on the on projects um so sometimes getting the approval to you know sign a large purchase order or sign a large compensation then may not be within your own gift uh, so you may well need authority or approval of those that are empowered to do it similarly on on project manager side they have um uh, they have a similar level of governance and authority. I mean, for example, when I worked in St. Pancras Station, the project manager there, bear in mind, you're talking about over £100 million worth of work being done at the time, could only issue a, a change, uh, an instruction for £25,000 capital spend. So, um, and you, you're kind of thinking, well, you know, there's going to be a, a lot of items which exceed that and, and the project manager has then has to go into his internal governance to get that authority to, to issue instruction which in some organizations can take two months um, so they can yeah. in, in their own way delay delay works absolutely well I'll, I'll close the poll now i think we still have um change um change management meaning of uh, everything else so um, i mean th that leads us to the um, kind of main topic of our discussion today i know we spend uh some time digging and trying to find why we need uh, digital um uh, uh, you know contract management cloud solutions but on the screen now you can see the main features what a good um solution can look like right so it has to be easy that's key uh, key um probably um key word in uh, in all of this um story of implementing something new on site because when we talk to um when we talked previously about you know this cultural shape change how people resist to that so it has to look easy and it has to feel easy because otherwise people are not going to be willing to learn something new it has to integrate with other um, products you're using on site whether you're using p6 to manage your schedules whether you're using some sap software to manage your cost has to integrate uh, workflows will need to uh, adapt to the type of your contract and i, I i'd like to bring something up here actually I, i'd like to hear from dream again is um sometimes it has to adapt to the form of contract and we know we have uh contracts with a lot of amendments and we observe that more and more but how do we stop a little bit of uh, you know a, a, a contract i call it contract bullying because when you when you introducing way too many changes and contradicting uh, each other and generating more ambiguities than helping teams to deliver the project 
it also becomes uh, an issue. So, um, Jim, any examples from your experience where you saw that something being introduced in the contract is really, uh, I, I know that you're using contract management software yourself, is really becoming an obstacle or how you can manage the system. Uh, are there any examples of such? I think, um, I think one of the problems I encountered when I went on to Crossrail, which is Whitechapel Station, um, which is I think one of the most complicated, um, was that the number of changes exceeded 5,000. Um, and uh, although the contract administration software can cope with that number of items, the actual teams on both sides can't cope because it's just, um, you know, initially the teams were formulated on, on that project uh, with a small amount of project managers, commercial people, and similarly on contractor side. To actually cope with that, um, change management uh, rigor that's needed, you know, notification of changes, approval of changes, pricing of changes, negotiation and agreement of changes, implementing uh, implementation of compensation events, itself can take take time for one item, never mind 5,000. And given that some of these could be, you know, several million pounds in, uh, in terms of value, um, can you know it, it, it could take somebody a week or even two weeks to price one of those items and then commensurately on the other side two two to three weeks to, to complete verification of it um, so it's it's a style new ball game in one sense but but what I'm trying to say is 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 trying to, with the teams that are set up to manage on this scale they're never, they're never set up properly in the first place because the parties don't anticipate perhaps don't really anticipate in the early stages that this level of change is going to occur, but uh, and they just manage and they and they recruit as as that change develops. But the reality is is, is that's an unmanageable amount of change for, for any organisation to efficiently manage and cost efficiently manage, and uh, yeah, and hence absolutely. hence what sort of premature hair loss on that project. Yeah, but equally, equally, the, the contract management uh, software, uh, especially if it's cloud-based, it's connecting, it, it should probably indicate those issues, right? So because it, sometimes in the paper, or if you manage something in a more traditional way, uh, just storing information on, um, even on the server, it, it's very difficult to see that you, um, you, you're going into the space where you, you struggle to manage something because you, it, it's, not, it's not something you can grasp immediately. You have to collect a lot of data from different people working in the project and understand how they work in order to see that full picture. In my, in my experience as well, I've seen examples where we have clients with um, contract management solutions who realize that the number of changes in the same way, so I, I actually will give probably a very similar example, the number of changes for the small value um, uh, on the project just had to be managed differently. And it's nothing to do with contract management solution. It's purely uh, the way you organize the things yourself. And then you can really see a, a huge difference in how you know more, much more efficient you become in um, in uh, the cloud solution as well. But just finishing off, so obviously secure data, uh, you know, making sure that even logins are so secure that you you're not exchanging. Uh, passwords and login details and you using your individual login details is, is crucially important because otherwise you keep uh, you, you keep losing control of uh, the spreadsheets and information you're pulling together on site and also real-time reports I know that reports probably and reporting something which came up last in the previous uh, in the previous poll but um, I think reports is still something where we struggle a lot we spend a lot of time um, populating reports which go out of date uh, almost immediately after the after reporting has been complete. So I think it's it's also it it makes life easier. It really makes it um, you know much more uh, time efficient. Um, so in terms of measuring success, so this this again this is something which. Um, contract management cloud solution can assist you with. So I'm pretty sure that all products available on the market tick all these boxes, and but they do it in slightly different way. I think what real contract management solution does, it also generates that um, 
safety, a, a kind of safe environment in terms of how you refer to different provisions in the contract, contract clauses, uh, you know, time bars. This is something um, contract, true contract management solution is, is designed to do, and it, it, it is something you expect, you can expect from, uh, from the product you uh, purchasing to use on your site. So in here, I really want to cover because um, obviously Dream has a lot of experience in um, in using different systems. So I think um, what I'd like to add in here is people know what they can do in digital, uh, you know, in contract management solution. I'd like to give a few examples how you can really make a difference by using a digital tool to manage your contracts on site. So uh, first of all, we all know that all contracts, our big projects have very transactional nature of contracts. So you may have something from 10 to 100 different um, suppliers, um, you know, uh, set up on your site, especially if you're managing supply chain in a contract management solution or your subcontractors. And sometimes you, you need to have a, a, an environment where you can really manage those contracts yourself. You don't want to go to your software vendor all the time and ask them to set up new contracts for you. I think in we, we, we touched on the flexibility of the contracts, but Jim, from your experience, how different are your contracts with your suppliers and your subcontractors on site? So are they really having different terms? Do you negotiate every time you go to a new contractor or new supplier, or they're more or less standard forms or if there are any changes, can you give an example of the change which sometimes you observe? Um, so I'll talk about my experience on HS2, where, where I was a lot more involved with the uh, supply chain. Um, so the majority of, I'll say, subcontractors with, who were doing large scopes of work were, were on uh, NEC, comparable NEC terms to, to ourselves. Um, Albeit, albeit with amendments, I guess, um, bespoke to their scope of works. And, you know, for example, you know, if you're building a couple of bridges, um, that there's contracts and scope would only would relate to those bridges and, and very little else. Um, so, um, and, and over a certain size and value, and I think our, our cap there was about a million, anything over a million, that was, uh, the subcontractors uh, account would, would be managed through CMAR. Um, you know, um, which, which, you know, with the experience we had there, they proved to be, be invaluable. Um, and the smaller subcontracts, because there's always those subcontracts where you, you, you get somebody in to do a bespoke, a little bit of work, could be like, you know, um, fire systems and site offices and stuff like that. Um, they may be procured on slightly different terms, you know, perhaps the NEC uh, not entirely suitable for, for, you know, small, very small value orders. They, they could be um, short forms of subcontract, um, lump sum prices and that type of thing. So, so they mm -hmm. would not be appropriate to go on a contract admin platform. So that's absolutely fine. But also, I mean, even if it's non-standard NEC, we can um, we can give you um, an option of of setting up contracts independently and making sure that you can actually make changes in terms of time um, um, response times. You know, adding new compensation events, changing matters for early warnings. It's just it just goes beyond uh, sometimes the standard form. But this is you know again in terms of um, role specific and compliant workflows that will be reflected in all of your reporting. So whenever you're creating a new report or you're running a new event. So the new event will pick up, um, you know, if, if you can see on the slide here on the right hand side, the, the, the screenshot at the bottom of the screen. So you can see that you can add additional compensation events, which can be different from what standard uh, NEC contract would contain. And you can really reflect those changes in here. And what it does, as I said, it creates that safe environment where from the drop down menu, you can only choose the items available for your contract, again, with amends and with all um, changes um, required, but you can't go beyond the, the contractual kind of contract terms and conditions you, you have, so which is um, which is obviously making a huge difference. So in here, I, I'd, um, I'd like to cover a little bit on um, contractual deadlines because we all know that NEC contracts will have very strict um, 
um, times to respond to certain events. And that this slide really indicates that you have uh, that helicopter view over all of your events um, currently being in the in the active workflow, right before they reach the final stage and before you can uh, you can uh, reach the stage when you have completed uh, the required steps to implement an event or to raise something and get an approval. So that is again uh, really something contract management software should should give you um, a, a clear understanding and actually highlight um, maybe some. Um, uh, in inefficiencies in the team, right? So you can see there, is, there are quite a few bars presented in red. So this chart is also interactive in our software. So if you click on the bars, you will be able to get to more detailed information about certain events and how you you want to manage it. So Jim, I, I want to skip to the next one, which is reporting. So and get your um, opinion, your observations about reporting. Obviously, again, in uh, in the contract management software, you should be able to report easier, right? Because you're already collecting a lot of data. All of the steps of uh, workflows go through the predefined um, um, steps in the in the software. So, how different you can see reporting with the support of contract management software? Is it easier or is it creating certain issues because it's it may be standardized and not giving you enough flexibility? Can you give uh, a few, I don't know, can you can you provide your view over that? So what's your observation? I think uh, in terms of the health of the project, the contract admin analytics um, can provide ex excellent um, uh, barometer as to whether the project's in good shape or bad. And that those graphs you had on the previous slide um, you know, um, it, uh, increasingly uh, projects are reporting on the performance of the teams. You know, is the project management team uh, responding to uh, notices strongly? Yes or no? You can then the, the, the graph will tell the story. And similarly, contractor. Yeah. Um, and these metrics are used in bigger organisations um, to, uh, I guess, to play one off against the other. They will say, well, you know. Contractor A, you're not very good on that particular project. You know, yeah, yeah. You've got 250 early warnings out of uh, missing. I mean, in terms of reporting, so that the health of the contract admin can be reported in that way. Um, I think the data, and we were looking at, I was speaking to you, this, to you about this earlier on, about how on HS2 we were using PRISM there to do the period end reporting um, as a bespoke platform and moving away from manual spreadsheets uh, and the data from uh, we were looking into how we could get the data from the change account via you know the platform of CMAR into PRISM so that there was no spreadsheet that was supporting that information which um, all these systems can can have errors but but the margin of error in, in a manual input spreadsheet and formula is, 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 is bigger especially if it's been put together by myself yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. Absolutely. No, I, I mean, it just helps to have a conversation. You don't need to use it as as a penalty, right? So it's not the information you would you would like to use to penalize your contractors or subcontractors. You or, uh, you know, equally, the, the client shouldn't use that against their contractor um, or project manager shouldn't be um, opening up to say that, you know, I can see what, what's happening and therefore we'll be, we'll be trying to kind of get some aggressive measures in place. It's more to have a conversation because I think this, this really helps to start the conversation in a positive way if you have this information on both sides. So I'd like to um, open up the last poll if possible. So um, can you please vote for us again? You can select multiple choices uh, in this uh, in this poll it's the it's your personal take on the values so what you personally see uh, for your business um, as a, the most positive uh, impact of um, kind of digitalizing your contract management processes so again i can see a single source of truth is currently the the very top one but we have other um, we have other opinions as well and the instant update on the second you you can hopefully see um re replies as well standard forms and letters instant updates and single source of truth is still being on on this poll um 
again, Jim, your observations about this. So we have a few minutes left before we can we can pick up any questions. If I don't know if you have any, please, if you have any questions, can you start typing them in? If if not, then uh, we, we can just take a few more minutes. But Jim, uh, from your experience again, so I can see single source of truth and instant updates is something people see as the, you know, delivering the most of the value. So what's, what's your opinion? I think that's correct, um, particularly on the, you know, we use DB on Crossrail, we using Sigmar um, on, on the last couple of projects. Um, that data is invaluable for reporting. Uh, it's all in one place. It tells you, you know, the value of implemented change. It tells you the value of quoted change. Um, you know, so I think, uh, you know, it, it, it deals with applications for payment. You can see the health of those, you know, payment against uh, applied recertified. So a, a, a single area where you get all of that information is got to be the way to go, isn't it, as we move forward? Okay, right. Um, whilst I'll be checking questions, so if any any uh, advice from you? Obviously, you are an extremely experienced um, individual working in commercial team and running commercial team. So, what would be your advice in terms of uh, utilizing, um, you know, cloud contract management software on the project? Because it's not a silver bullet, right? So we we can't resolve all the issues by suddenly having a software in place, but you know, what, what advice would you give? Okay, um, so in addition to that, I'll just, uh, and there's a few takeaways as well. One, team building workshops are uh, invaluable on projects, right? Um, because that's how you build relationships. If, you, if you're lucky enough to get on at the beginning or just before the job starts or during the ECI phase of a project, team building with the client's team and, and contractor's team is invaluable to build relationships because it is all about relationships, collaboration. Um, always have a discussion with the, your opposite person that you deal with, always call them, speak to them uh, and, and try and avoid emails and hiding behind computers. Um, raise and respond to notices within the prescribed time frame if you can, you know, uh, using the uh, online, online tool that you've got. Um, talk to your project manager about bundling quotes together to, to save time. Um, so similar themed items, you can say you've got 10 items relating to a trial hole, can you put them in one and, and do one program associated with it if it's not complicated? Uh, yes. Can you bundle together um, extensions to quotation submission dates or quotation response? Is Can they be bundled together and dealt with? I know they have to be managed individually on the platform but can they be submitted as one to save time um, that we did on on, on Crossrail and it was very successful because we, we, we did we were failing to meet the submission dates on quite a few of those um, and use use a platform like CMR or similar you know we used site for London Underground but, but, uh, and there, there are others uh, others I'm not familiar with that those are invaluable tools to manage your contract administration requirements and and get trained because so train your staff it's not the qs's job to put the notices on all these things encourage your staff delivery planners quality to put their own notices on and they can only do that with a bit of encouragement and training okay okay well we have uh, we have quite a few questions here in the chat um so i just um i just struggle at the moment to see and expand the just give me one second. So I have. So um, right. So I, I have a few questions in here. Um, just trying to expand this. Uh, apologies for that. So we we have a bit of issue with the the way it looks in. The, um, Um, one second. So, in the meantime, could you please uh, apologize for um, for the delay here? If we don't get to the question, so it's just because I'm trying to expand the window here and it's not working properly. So we will answer them individually. So we'll come back to you on uh, on your questions. But um, could you please scan QR code on the last page? So if you haven't put your 
if you join the webinar later and you haven't put your details for us to collect and think project, please feel, uh, please populate it. That there are only four or five, um, uh, four or five um, different fields for you to fill in. So um, there are a few people attending from Hong Kong, and I can see um, some questions, interesting sharings. I do have some personal opinions on some issues raised, like disputes, contract administration, and you see collaboration and tradition. I mean, there's some there is some feedback more there than questions. But yeah, um, I, I think we close to closing the webinar. So I will pick up apologies about that. So we just I can't see them um, properly, the questions in the field. So we will pick up your questions with Dream and we will come back to you if there is anything specific on the topic. So we'll come back to you. I can see quite a few of them, but for some reason I can't expand the window here. Um, so thank you. I mean, I would like to thank everyone for attending webinar today and Dream for this interesting discussion. And it's, as I said, it's always interesting to hear about your experience and maybe a few words, closing words from you as well, Jim. Um, you know, it's not, you know, client-based systems are the way forward. There has to be, but, but and it's not all, all uh, rosy, sweetness and light. You know, we do have disagreements. We do have um, differences of opinion, but we can resolve